ripped out about a oh probably a 14 inch bladed buoy knife and he just started swinging and he was hitting people and people the guys that were trying to take over the bus he hit like three of them a couple of them hung out of the door he was flooring it and uh we just watched this bloody mess drop off the back of the bus and i remember the bus driver bus driver takes his knife wipes it off on his pants and stuffs it back under the seat and looks over at me and smiles and i'm like you've got to be shitting me this guy this guy is used to this that was jeff courier telling a story from the first african fly fishing trip this crazy story and many more today on the wet fly swing fly fishing show Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I want to give a quick shout out to our amazing supporters on our Patreon page. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N to uh, get started today. In today's episode, I chat with Jeff Courier about his prolific career catching almost 400 species of fish on the fly. We talk about how you can put together an African tiger fishing trip, uh, the car that took him 500,000 miles and helped him to travel the world, and his favorite travel uh, items. Jeff tells us about a great story for African tigers, his favorite hooks, and some amazing history um, about some of his other travels. Don't miss this as Jeff shares a bunch of great tips that should get you thinking about getting out of your uh, fish box and traveling more this year. So, without further ado, here's Jeff Courier. How's it going, Jeff? That's going good. How about you, Dave? Good, good. Good to have you on. We've uh, got a bunch to talk about here. I think all these shows that I do, it seems like trying to focus things is always the challenge. And for you especially, since you've... I'm not sure. You're somewhere between 400 and 500 uh, species caught on the fly, so uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But uh, before we jump into all the stuff you've done, uh, maybe you can start us off and talk about how you got into fly fishing. Well, I grew up in a uh, fishing family, so I came from Massachusetts, and my dad was a fly fisherman, and back there, there weren't a lot of them, so I was pretty focused on him because he, you know, he was doing stuff that other people weren't doing. And the reason he was such a good fly fisher is because my grandfather was. My grandfather actually had an uh, outdoor shop, and he was an Orvis-endorsed uh, shop back in the 40s and 50s before I was born. So I, uh, when I grew up, the basement was, was full of stuff and uh, started fishing at a very early age. And my dad taught me when I was probably seven or eight. And, you know, he was a busy man the rest of the year, so it just came together. Growing up in that neck of the woods, it's not so much trout as it is, you know, your warm water species, which are pretty fun and easy for a kid to catch. And it's easy to fall in love with the sport. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. So your your grandfather started out, and what was the, the name of the, the shop? Or was it a fly shop only? No, it was a sports. It was called Andy Sports Shop. And uh, he sold everything from tents to canoes to, you know, fly rods. I actually have one of the... Uh, one of his fly rods, it's an old Orvis bat and kill bamboo from, I think uh-huh. it was built in 1940-something. And, uh, yeah, I don't use it. It's got a hairline fracture, but I, I definitely take it out and look at it once in a while. It's pretty cool to have. That's cool. And have you ever, I'm not sure um, uh, your exact age, but I, I have talked to a couple, who was it? Um, oh, I guess uh, Flip, uh, Flip Pallet was on, or I was chatting with him, and he was talking about how, how he was using, back in the day, using bamboo for, like, salt water, and he was talking about how the, the rod wouldn't recover and stuff like that. Did you ever, have you ever tested that out on any, any big species in any type of bamboo? No, the, no, the biggest uh, fish I probably ever caught was because I did fish that rod on my first trip out west with my dad in 1982, and uh, I got a big I got a big uh, rainbow on the Henry's fork and I'm lucky that rod didn't explode because it was later on that trip. We went on a guided trip and the guide spotted the hairline fracture in the tip. And he's like, yeah, I don't think if this rod means something to you from your grandpa, you probably shouldn't be fishing. And I'm like, okay, let's put it yeah. away. I'll save it. I got my big fish on it. I'll leave it right there. That's right. Yeah. That's probably a good thing. Nice. So, okay. Well, that's good. And so Andy was your, uh, I guess your grand, that was your grandfather. Yes. Okay. And then, and then as he, uh, your grandpa, so did your dad take over the shop and then, or did the shop just kind of, uh, what happened to the old, the old, uh, the sporting goods store? 
You know, I think uh, it had something to do with the government building I-95 right through his shop, and oh. they relocated him. And uh, yep. <laughs> this is a long story behind it, but uh, it all sure. happened before I was born. And, uh, yeah, he was just retired when I was a kid. And unfortunately, he wasn't fishing too much. I think he had a little bad taste in his mouth from that. But my dad sure fished. and My dad fished right up till you know, till he could recently. So hmm. it's in the, in the genes. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh so yeah, I want to get into, you know, just talking about, and, and what are you up to now that the species count? Well, officially the count is at 397. Okay. So, oh, so um, you're, okay. You're right there. Yeah. But there's probably, you know, I would say it's probably over 400 because there's probably a dozen fish that I don't know the names of or have forgotten. I, I gradually, for the last five, six years, I've been going through like every photo of my life. And you always stumble across something, you know, most recently it was like a French grunt that I caught in Belize many years ago. And I'm like, oh, geez, that's not the list. Put it on. So, nice. but yeah, officially 397 are actually all listed on my website. Okay. I had quite a few last week down in uh, French Polynesia. I had a really good trip and added about six or seven new fish. It was cool. Wow. Wow. So when you're out there adding fish, I mean, I guess you kind of go to target, uh, you know, a species or two, but do you just happen to catch something? You're like, oh my God, I wasn't expecting this. Absolutely. I yeah. always carry the camera on my neck to point and shoot and get a shot of it. Look it up when I get home. Oh, no kidding. What, how many, uh, out of the, all the species you've caught, how many of them have been just, um, ones you'd had no idea you were going to catch if you had just run Oh boy. It? Oh man, it would probably, it would have to probably be, I would say half of them uh-huh. would, would likely be. I mean, that's about what it was on this most recent trip. You know, I went there for Napoleon wrasse and came back with two other kinds of wrasses as well. So, wow. yeah, you start to get down to the nitty gritty here. There's, there's not a lot of big name game species out there left to catch. So it's, you yeah. know, it's a lot of, a lot of side, sidebar fish, which is cool. Yeah. It's fun. It's like being a scientist. That is cool. That is cool. Yeah. So the, as you get down there, I mean, what do you think, you know, uh, as far as the aid number, I mean, obviously you've got like a 500 number that's out there still, but I mean, if you, if time wasn't an issue, do we have any idea how many species you could catch? I think 500 is probably, uh, I mean, I think you could, you could take it even further than that, but you're going to have to start getting, you know, start catching some real small fish on the reefs and maybe in the Amazon, bring your, bring your three weight and a micro dry fly. But I think as far as like, you know, recognizable fish probably around 500 okay. I, I would say that's i probably won't get much past that but i'm sure going to try and get to it okay okay cool so and we're going to dig a little bit into tigers down in africa and things like that but i just wanted to follow up a little more on the you know this idea of the 500 because it's kind of a you know it takes a certain person to to do this i think of you know myself and it's not even close to what you're doing but you know doing a weekly podcast show takes a little bit of a certain person to you know to do it every week you know and and you've, you've been doing this for a long time, right? And you've been focused. I mean, what, what got you going on this? And what, what do you think, would you say, is, is it your personality or how, how did this all get started? Well, I think it's uh, my curiosity of fish. I've always loved fish and uh, did a little bit of studies of ichthyology in college. And so I'd have to say there's never been like, you know, one fish is better than another. You know, it doesn't matter size or species. I've always found <clears throat> something interesting in them. Um, my whole life, I guess it goes back to, you know, growing up in Massachusetts where we didn't have very good trout fishing, but we had, you know, a pond near my house had, you know, black crop, you had pumpkin seeds, bluegills and smallmouth and largemouth. And, you know, I always, every time I went fishing, it was like, wow, there's another new one. So I think I got interested at a very early age and, uh, just never stopped. Luckily I've been fortunate to live a lot of parts of the country and travel all over the world. So there's always something new to invigorate me, you might say. And, uh, yeah, it's never going to end ever. No. Love it. <laughs> no. And you, so you start out and and you said Massachusetts is where you grew up. Yep. That and, uh, summers in New Hampshire, up New- on Lake Winnipesaukee. Okay. New Hampshire's and then, and then you kind of bounced around the country. What was your process? Cause I think, are you in the West now? You're in Idaho. Yep. I live in Victor, Idaho. Been here for almost 30 years. Prior to this was Jackson, Wyoming. So it's just over the hill. That's more of a, you know, nobody can afford to live in no. Jackson type of thing. <laughs> But I studied in uh, northern Wisconsin, you know, went to college, and I did several internships over the years in Minnesota, you know, and just got around a lot, you know, did a lot of, uh, you know, I guess, off-campus studies, so I was traveling quite a bit, 
and uh, my my major is outdoor education. So okay. yeah, it's just got to see a lot of a lot of cool species from around the country, and then it just. When I became an adult, I actually wasn't paying off my student loans anymore. Then I could, you know, spend a little money to, to travel before mm-hmm. it became part of my business. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I want to dig a little more into the travel piece, too, because I, I have a few questions on that. And um, I was just thinking as you're talking about, you know, where you, you kind of got to this point. You worked for Jack Dennis. Is that correct back in the day or a while back? Yeah. So... From 1987 till 2009, I worked at the Jack Dennis Fly Shop right there in Jackson Hole, and I, I managed the store for probably 20 of those 23 years, right up till the end. Oh wow! Okay, and what what happened at the end? Um, well, you know the the economy started to tank, and uh, they actually took away some of my time off, and that you know can't go fishing if you don't have the proper amount of time off. So I, I couldn't go backwards; I had to go forward. Yeah. And uh, I had been considering leaving anyway. I, you know, I think I was 44 at the time. And I figured out when I got to 50, and then I would consider maybe doing something on my own. And not another shop by any means. I wanted to go full-time with my artwork. And, uh, you know, I just ended up having to start early because they annoyed me. And I thought I was going to be all art, and I'd be struggling to make it. But as soon as I left that shop, the phone started ringing. You know, there were a lot of... You know, like my my sponsors, you know, Winston would be one right out of Scientific Anglers. As soon as they knew that I didn't work in that shop, they wanted to have me more, you know, 100% devoted to their rods and their fly lines. And, you know, it's hard to explain. I couldn't believe it. Yep. Things worked out and worked out fast. And it's, it still is working. I love working with my, my companies and sponsors and I get to fish a lot. I can't believe it. Yeah, that's great. So you basically, yeah, I mean, you put your you put your time in like a lot of people do and you know, whether it's uh, fly fishing or whatever, you know, industry you're in, but yeah, you put your time in and then the opportunities just kind of came knocking. That's, that's a pretty cool story. Yeah. It's fun. It's almost like there's no formula for it. I get asked all the time, you know, younger people are like, so what do I do to do what you're doing? I'm like, you know, I'd say fish and work hard yeah, and uh, hopefully it lays out for you, but fish hard comes first because that's what you really get, you know, people learn about you from you know if you're a good angler and share what you know with other people that's what gets it started yep yep cool cool well let's dig in a little bit to you know i think we, obviously you've got almost 400 species that you've caught but uh you know focusing this down we're going to talk a little bit today about tiger fish and i guess specifically africa and there's probably some people probably a lot of people who never really thought about much about these fish or maybe you know might not ever go fish for them but i was hoping you can just talk a little bit about you know what it's all about what it takes to to do that trip you know if it's something that um i mean obviously it's a remote place but um yeah maybe you just start us off and talk about the last trip you did for these and, and what that experience was like yeah i guess uh first i'll just add to that it really is kind of like you said a lot of people it's not even on their radar and um I guess realistically, you know, 20 years ago, it probably wasn't on anybody's radar, you know, like 1% of Americans because it is so far away. And there's so many other interesting fish that are closer to us, you know, not just in North America, but it seems like, you know, the last 15 years, the rage has been going to South American fishing peacocks and Golden Dorado. And, you know, I guess the tigers, because they're the furthest away, are the ones that it's taken the longest to to hit the, the map. But you know, they're, they're really not that far away. We all get in airplanes and we go places and, uh, Africa's, you know, it's a, it's a long flight, but you can get there. And, uh, most of the, the tiger fishing that we can be exposed to is stuff on the Zambezi or in Botswana and the Okavanga, or probably the one that I've done the most and most recently would be in Tanzania. And, uh, that's probably the biggest, they're not Goliath tigers. There's many different species of tigers too, by the way but they're the ones that uh, they get pretty darn big. They're pretty awesome fish. Yeah. So, and on that line, as far as getting there, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously people, you can fly around, buy a ticket, things like, is there a potential, like if somebody was serious, you know, they listen to this today and they're getting all jacked up I and mean, what would you recommend um, the best, you know, route for somebody to maybe, uh, I guess to start first, learn more about it, but also maybe put together a trip. Yeah, I would say the best thing to do would be to, to email me from my website. And, uh, you know, I can tell you all about the trip, what you're going to do. Sometimes I even may have a hosted trip there. But uh, we do 
all our Africa stuff, I say we. I work with Yellow Dog. They're one of my sponsors, and I'm an ambassador for them. And they are probably the kings of booking tiger fish trips in Africa. And I think it's good to go through a company like Yellow Dog because, to be quite honest with you, a lot of people don't know how to go about going to Africa. Like, I've spent this whole morning working on getting my visa. In fact, I've spent the last three days. I'm trying to get a visa to go to Cameroon in March. And, uh, you know, travel agencies like Yellow Dog know how to do all that stuff for you. And also, um, and you get to pay for your trip. And people are not comfortable, you know, wiring money to Africa. No. Uh, whereas you got Yellow Dog is based right there in Montana. So, you know, you're dealing with a U.S. company. They're dealing with all the international stuff. And they're also making sure that you're prepared for all the international stuff. Because it is, Africa's a long list from shots to, um, you know, the visas to, you know, how do you fly there? All kinds of stuff. Yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, the, that is kind of, I've done that a few times where you have to wire wire money over. And <laughs> think about doing that on your own, man. There's no, when you're doing it, there, there's no, uh, if that money's gone, somebody takes it, it might be gone. So that, that's a, a great point. Well, in, in thinking about this now, as far as the trip, let's just think, you know, for example, if it was myself and I was kind of chatting with you, and I wanted to put together this trip, maybe, you know, a yellow dog, obviously that would be the best way to do it, you know, if you had the cash. But if I was going to just kind of do the best to do it on the, uh, you know, maybe save a little money and pick your brain about stuff, you know, what might, you know, where might we start if I had a question like, how do, how do I get the start? What's the first thing to do to, to start, you know, putting together this trip? Well, I can, if you lean towards what I think sounds like a little bit of a do it yourself, that's how my first trip to Africa happened because there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of eyes on the tiger fishing over there. And I couldn't, you know, go to yellow dog. Yellow dog was just starting. And even some of the older travel companies in the U S they really didn't have an Africa program, but I'd done it before in other parts of the world. I kind of started with central America, then South America, and then, you know, did Asia. Africa was the last thing. And my wife and I, we wanted to go to Africa and catch tiger fish. And I finally just said, you know what? Screw it. Well, I'm just going to go over there like we usually do with our backpacks and spend three months. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, 20 years ago, I guess we did that trip in, I think it was 2005. It was, uh, you know, the place to go in Africa, everybody always thought was Kenya. You know, that's kind of where it started. And I remember calling Delta, and I think I had 200,000 miles in the, in the bank with Delta. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, we want to go to Kenya and blah, blah, blah. We're going to start a trip. And I just remember hearing all the tapping, and she's like, sorry, we can't get you to Kenya with your free miles. I'm like, okay, well, how about, uh, you know, maybe Tanzania? Nope, click, click. Nope, can't do that. Sorry. They almost enjoy telling you you can't use your miles. And finally, I said, you know what, lady? Just send me somewhere. (laughs) Send me and my wife somewhere in Africa. She's like, what do you mean? I said, just fly us to Africa, wherever we can fly to for free. And uh, we ended up in Lusaka, Zambia. And I remember whipping out the map and looking at it. I'm like, huh. That's absolutely perfect. We're, you know, 50 miles from the Zambezi. No way. So, yeah, so we spent the next three months. We flew there on 1st of October and stayed through Christmas. And uh, we basically went upstream on the Zambezi as far as we could, and we we kind of won it. But I will say, winging it in Africa was the hardest place I've ever had to wing it. And if we were there for three months, we probably got, you know, 10 days of decent fishing yeah. Um, the whole time. So hmm. tiger fish winging it, not so easy to do. And yeah. a lot of it has to do not just with there's, you know, most of the waters that you can get to are overfished because, um, you know, you send malaria nets over there, unfortunately they turn to fishing nets and the places that are good fishing are so remote that you have a good chance of getting eaten by a crocodile or killed by a, a hippo and the list goes on. It's, right. it's not the same as yeah. going other places. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. So it's not the, uh, definitely, this is one place where the, the, the DIY probably isn't the, although you did it just, but you are a little more of a, you know, explorer, uh, you know, you're, you've got that mindset for most people. It definitely not a safe place to, to do the DIY thing. Got to have some experience. I'd say, you know, do the, do I do your own thing and places like Central and South America first yeah. and then kind of put that build, Africa at the end like build we yourself did. up. Okay, cool. Well, maybe I'll follow up with you here in a couple of years down the line when we get some uh, get some other uh, shows out and we can follow up on some of this. I, I, you know, thinking about it, you know, again, getting back to this, 
um, you know, the DIY thing. I, I don't want to touch on that because I, you know, too much here because I want to focus on some of the tiger, you know, just kind of what you're doing, what you did out there. But what would you say is another place, if you had to say somebody, you know, maybe both at home, maybe in the U.S. and then abroad, what would be the, the two easiest trips to, to DIY, do you think, that might be a, a real cool trip for somebody? Well, I would say going down to uh, Patagonia and trout fishing, that's a, a great do-it-yourself um, trip because it's, it's really laid back. You know, bus systems are very good. Um, we know the fishing, you know, I think most people know how to trout fish. So, you know, they go down there. It's not like they have to figure out the fish. They just have to figure out the places. And I will say from my experience down there, almost all the water has, has good trout fishing. So that's a great way to start in the okay. language. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a language barrier, but it's, you know, Easier. it's a good one to do as your first one. Yeah. Cause Spanish is something we're all a little bit familiar with. And quite yeah. frankly, if you put your mind to it, it's not that hard. Um, so that's, I'd say, the first one, and that's probably the best one, a great place for people to get started. Yep, yep, definitely, definitely. And then, and then if you had to say, I mean, we've talked about a few different species around the U.S., you know, muskies and muskie and pike and, you know, I mean, we've got some amazing stuff here. What do you think is a good, I mean, I guess the it's wide open here in, as far as the U.S. where you want to go. I mean, if you had to pick one, what, what would you be going for? Geez, maybe I would just... Uh... You know, go up into Canada actually and just do some pike fishing on my own. Yeah, that would be uh, fun. Load up the van and you know go up there with a canoe or something and yep, and do it that way. That'd be awesome. That's cool. And what uh, or Alaska or Alaska? Exactly. That was the next thing I was going to say. Alaska, Canada. That's pretty much pr- pretty remote. You can get you can get away from people up there. So. Um, what do you think? Now you mentioned the van. I just uh, before we get into the tigers, I did have a couple of uh, kind of off the tangent questions here. What what kind of van are you talking about here? What, what's your what's your travel van? Well, I don't have a travel van yet, but we're thinking of selling the house and moving into a uh, uh, some sort of a small camper or uh, one of the one of the hot vans. Now that everybody's running around, and I can't remember the name. But oh, oh yeah, like the tall wife. tall ceiling van, one of the um, yeah yeah, yeah uh, whatever they call those. Well, you know, yep. Yeah, you know, gotcha. split me, but uh, yeah, we're actually downsizing the last couple of years here. I've sold just about, we've sold a lot of our junk, put it that way. We've had a couple of big yard sales. Yeah. Just in case we finally decide we're going to do it, because uh-huh. uh, we're also getting a little sick of the cold weather as you get older. I went from being like maniac ice fisherman living in northern Wisconsin and Minnesota and chasing Lakers here the first 15 years I lived here to now being like, oh, crap, it's five degrees out. Yep. Hey, get out of here. That's right. There, there's it's a, normal, I think. It is. I think that's the, there's a reason why uh, old, the old people, you know, that moved to Florida and all that stuff. I mean, it's it's true. It takes it, uh, the, the cold weather, man, it, it takes it out of you. That's for sure. You're, uh, yep. Things hurt more. Yeah. Okay. Getting so, warm is good. So what, so now, so your van, so you guys, if you do go that route, you, you do the, the van thing. I mean, what does that look like? I mean, you, you find a nice Southern you know, park it in a down head to Mexico sort of thing and find a off of the Baja and, and find a home down there. So is that kind of, or, or just, just keep traveling? Yeah, probably uh, January and February. You know, I've got to I'm probably going to have to work till the day I die just because the lifestyle's taken. I don't have any money, but I can make it by doing shows and, and uh, selling my art. You know, when I say sell my art, yes, I do some paintings and I actually did quite a few things for, for Christmas, but I have my, coffee mugs and beer stein business with my fish and I license my fish to go on all kinds of things. So when I'm at the shows, people see me out there. I might be doing some, some talks about, you know, I might do a dead casting demonstration or a PowerPoint presentation, but I also have a booth and I'm selling my stuff. So I would always do that. So I might just drive show to show. Oh, cool. But when the, when the shows wrap up in the end of March, then I probably, you know, Boz where I've been going for 20 years, I probably would go down there and know where I'm pretty good. Yeah. Um, but I also like carp fishing. I mean, I like just driving around, you know, the Phoenix area for crying out loud and catching grass carp. And I'm yeah. sure there's hundreds of other places down south that could do that and be very enthralled for the four months of bad weather going on up here in Idaho. Totally. Yeah, I hear you. No, it's 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 cool to hear your your perspective on it because I think uh, you know everybody's different, and it definitely you know, the way you talk sounds like something that that I've thought about you know a, a few times, and I think. I'm totally kind of the nomad. I, I haven't been the nomad, but I, I kind of feel like I love that sort of stuff. And, you know, my challenge is I've got a couple of young kids right now, so I, I got a little bit of time to wait before um, 
before I could get there. But uh, no, that's good stuff. I, I appreciate you uh, sharing, you know, a little bit of the background there. I think, you know, people that are trying, like you said, young people are getting into this. And I talked to a lot of people on all ends of the spectrum. And and it's always the question we talk about that keeps coming up is, you know, if you want to do it, how do you do it? And um, it seems like there's no one way. You just pretty much, like you said, you put your time in and you you do something. I mean, obviously you're passionate about it and, and you find a way. Yeah. It takes courage. You know, you gotta, you gotta make some big moves, life changing moves along the way and, you know, sacrifices, you know, and, uh, some people can do it. Some people can't. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, before we break one more, before we break in, cause I had a cut another note here on automobiles. I've, I've, uh, <laughs> always loved some of the things I caught. I saw something about the, um, just looking at your history, the, the Aspen car. And, uh, yeah, Aspen I, I, is a legend. Yeah. I'd love to ha- have you maybe just go a short little talk about like what that car, you know, has meant to, to you and your wife and fishing and, uh, because, or, and maybe you could paint a picture of what that car looks. I'm not even sure if you still have it. It's in the yard. It's, uh, covered with snow, not looking too good these days, but it's there. Probably that would be another thing. If I ever left the house here, what am I going to do with the Aspen? I can't bring it with me. I have to finally, I have to finally give up on it. But, uh, when I was 17 years old, I was, you know, just a typical teenage boy wrecking everything I touched. And, uh, my grandma died and my old man was like, give him her car. And when he wrecks it, then he can go buy his own damn car. He was, you know, I think my dad had just had it with me and, uh, I got that car and I remember that car. I was kind of mad they gave it to me because, um, it's not a very cool car, although it does look a little bit like a Nova or a Roadrunner, yeah. but it was kind of like a, a wimpy old lady version of it. <laughs> but also my grandma couldn't take that 20 miles to the shopping mall without it breaking down. So I knew I was doomed. Well, damn, if that thing didn't go on with ever, without breaking down for the next 25 years. So I ended up putting 517,000 miles on. I didn't retire it till I was 38 years old. And I, I probably did nothing more than an oil change. Probably only did those about once every two years too, because I was so irresponsible. So that car, because I never had a car payment and never will in my life, because I drove that till I was 38, um, allowed me to, you know, have a little extra money to fish, to, you know, put some money down in a house. Um, it's just incredible hmm. what that car did for me. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm not a big believer in the afterlife so much, but I got to think that. You know, maybe grandma was up there watching over me. I mean, for crying out loud. So I kept it. It's in the yard. And if I'm having a bad day, I might go out there and sit and listen to the Cubs game on the hood, (laughs) have a beer midday once in a while. And, uh, yeah, it's therapeutic. Yeah. Looking at it right now. No kidding. (laughs) Getting covered with snow. How many? Go dust it off. How many miles does it have on it? 517 is when it died. No way. Yep. That's a lot of miles, but it had a slant six. So really the, the car rotted all around the engine the last the last five or six years it wasn't safe i actually got banned from wyoming and <laughs> uh i still went over there because i had to work there but i just didn't venture from i went over from you know just across the border into jackson to get to work but i drove it over teton pass for 18 years Jeez. and uh yeah the thing is an animal it, it's good and it's uh really good uh, it, what so they asked me is that a chevy or what kind of what kind of car is that Nope, Dodge. Oh, Dodge, Dodge Aspen. Yep, that, Dodge Aspen. That's cool. Uh, There's another potential sponsor for you. Have you has Dodge come knocking yet? Uh, I actually did approach them many years ago with somebody else's idea. Yeah, They're like, yeah, great. You know, when people put five hundred thousand dollars on or five hundred thousand miles in their car, that means they're not buying any cars. Have a great day. <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's true. Gosh, last thing they want is a guy like me. Guys, all right, okay. Well, let's let's dig into a little bit on the uh, the tigers because I think, you know, for those people that maybe you know are thinking about it or maybe down the line, who knows, right? Maybe there's some different thing that comes up and things change, and it's a little bit easier for folks. Can you break down, you know, as far as you're on the river, how is it different, or what does it take to get into, you know, to these fish? Uh, I mean, are you using a boat? Or are you doing this from the, the bank? And what type of uh, gear are you using? Uh, just kind of some general. Uh, some general topics here yeah well let's just start by saying they are a really incredible game fish they are you know there's a few freshwater game fish of africa but i'd have to say the tigers are number one and um i'll just put one thing in perspective imagine you're uh you know an african kid and you know there there are trout in africa that were stocked by the english in the last hundred years but uh, in general it's not a 
trout continent, but maybe there's a kid that loves to fish and he's caught tiger fish and he knows about trout. And he's like, man, someday, someday I'm going to go to the USA and I'm going to catch trout. <laughs> Having no idea how many different kinds of trout there are, you know, rainbows, brookies, cutthroats, even different kinds of cutthroats. Well, the tigers are actually kind of the same way. Americans are like, yeah, someday I'm going to catch a tiger fish, but there's actually a lot of different kinds of tiger fish. So, so, so we'll are they, start with that. Uh, yeah, are, are they yeah. in the tiger fish? I know they're, I mean, I guess that's one thing, you know, they do have these crazy teeth. I mean, they look like basically a, a piranha that's the size of a salmon. Are, are there... Are there, there's fish up to 20 plus pounds and then there's also some really small ones or is there everything in between? Um, there's, I'd say that, you know, I haven't heard of any tigers that probably don't get up to 20 pounds. The Zambezi tigers and the Egyptian tigers that I've seen, it's probably pretty rare nowadays to get one that big, but you know, 13, 14, 15 pounders, Mm -hmm. they happen. They happen quite a bit. Um, but then you do start getting to other bigger tigers, like the ones we catch in Tanzania. It's interesting. Um, the guys that found them, their company is called Tourette. They've become great friends of mine. In fact, that's who I'll be fishing with when I'm in Cameroon in March. But um, these guys, you know, explorer kids, were trying to find Goliath tigers that they could fly fish for, which Goliath tigers, who knows how big they get, probably at one time 100 pounds. Now if you get one over 50, that's pretty incredible. And they were trying to put together a Goliath tiger fly fishing thing. The place you really find them is in um, the Congo, and that's a pretty tough place to go. It's, uh, you know, not real safe government-wise and travel-wise, and it's just too remote to put anything together. So they were trying to find them outside the Congo, and there are some places outside the Congo. But anyway, they found the, the Tanzania tigers. They stumbled across these incredible tiger fish, and they look very much like the Goliath. They thought they had nailed some mm-hmm. Goliaths. And because their first trip, too, they got fish up to, I think, 25 pounds. So, I mean, first trip, you imagine if you just start turning turning it over for a while, you're going to get some fish up to 30. And they haven't got a 30 yet, I don't think, but I think they've got some fish 28, 29, so it'll happen. Anyway, it turns out they weren't Goliaths after all. They were their own thing, so they're Tigerfish Tanzania. And uh, Tanzania is a great country. It's a safe country. Uh, Their outfit there um, is absolutely incredible and one of the most beautiful remote places on the planet and uh it's there's there's a lot of these tiger fish there so i would i would label it the best place to go catch tiger fish on a fly rod okay okay and and so when you get out there on the water maybe just break down a little bit on the i mean you're using kind of steelhead type uh, gear and i you know leader and stuff like that step and then flies you're you're doing the old i mean these are predators so you're that that whole predator prey sort of thing yeah, it's a, it's a casted strip thing, and the, probably the best rod for it would be a nine weight. You know, you could get by with an eight, and ten would be a little heavy, but it, you know, at the same time, there's fish big enough that it's not such a big deal. But I go nine weight. I fish a floating line, and because it's tropical, you know, it's it's hot. You're near the equator. You're using uh, you know your typical tropical lines. So, mm-hmm. you know, I work with with scientific anglers, so one of their big water tapers or Titan tapers is going to be the best. Um, cause it can handle the heat and also turns over big flies. Mm-hmm. You do fish pretty good, pretty good sized flies for these. And, uh, you know, I think now the, the all round go to streamer, if, if you don't really know exactly what you need, is you kind of grab, you know, one of those Puglisi style, you know, black and purple. Mm-hmm. And that fly will do the job on tiger fish. And, uh, I mentioned not, not, not a small fly, a big fly, but, Tigers have an interesting mouth. You know, you get this great big fish that's 15 pounds and you look at his mouth and it's really not that big and it's very, very full of teeth. So my first trip, when my wife and I did that trip, I had a lot of, you know, I brought tarpon sized flies and they had tarpon sized hooks, but hooking tigers on a, on a size four odd hook is really hard because there's not a place for that big hook to perch. So I like, you know, two odds, probably my favorite size uh, hook to fish for tiger fish. But I do like that streamer I mentioned, and also yeah, I always bring a few bright colors. And, but for the most part, I go dark flies. Gotcha, gotcha. And you're casting, yeah, you're finding basically holes around structures and casting out there and then just stripping and doing like a strip set? Yep. And, you know, and I'm glad you said that because there's definitely times, too, when we are when we know we're going to be fishing um, holes in deeper water, then you might then you might go with a 300-grain sinking line oh, yeah. to fish those holes. So ideally, two rods set up. 
you know, because you catch tigers in the rapids on your floating line and you drop into the hole and you drop that sinky line. And, uh, you know, most of that fishing there is we're floating because, you know, you asked about floating or waiting. You've mm-hmm. got to be floating because the hippos and the crocodiles, you oh. just cannot in the water. Gotcha. Chances are if it's good fishing, it's good for all the wildlife too. And a crocodile yeah. won't eat you fast. There's always a huge argument from the locals, you know, which is the most dangerous animal. They think about it. And I'm sure they're thinking about, okay, the last guy that got killed by something yeah. was George got eaten by a croc. Yeah. So I'll say crocodile <laughs> today, but a week later, you could change the hippo or lion. Yeah. God, that and is. And you asked about leaders. Yeah. yeah. Very strong leaders. So, you know, nobody's really fishing IGFA anymore, you know, very few people. So, you know, the object is to catch the fish. So we usually use straight 40 pound mono and attach it to a wire leader. So 40 okay. pound mono oh, and, uh, you know, 40 pound wire. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and, uh, can you explain the, uh, IGFA a little bit of, of that and then why nobody's following that anymore or worrying about that? Well, I mean, number one, you know, most IGF records are old and, and the fish died. I mean, they do have catch and release records now and they're doing girth oh, and yeah. length. You know, I'll be honest with you. I, some of those don't seem that accurate to me. I mean, I, we did a measurement for my wife not too long ago, actually down in Belize and I mean, the girth and length came out to 176 pounds on a tarpon, and I've caught plenty of tarpon over 100 pounds. This fish was like 120. So I won't go there, but that's one thing. And then the other thing is, you know, IGFA, you know, the the tippet size for fly fishing, I think, is 22 pounds or just under. You know, it's in kilograms, but that's about what it adds up to. Good luck landing you know, a 50 pound giant trevally on a flat that has coral nearby right. on 20 pound test. Yep. So here we are, a guy like you or me travels all the way to the Seychelles. We get to do it, you know, yep. very infrequently. Let's just say we want to catch the dang fish. So throw the IGFA out there, throw that 22 pound tippet out there and fish straight 80 or even heavier and hook your fish and put some pressure on and land them. And uh, you get your picture and the fish actually gets released healthier because Yep. got landed quicker. Yeah. You know, and he's not taking off swimming around the ocean with a fly hanging out of his mouth or, or a dozen because people are using too light a line. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, it brings up a lot of questions I have, and I won't be able to get into the, all of the things that, that pop in my head. But, yeah, I mean, things have changed over the years. And, you know, I just think back in one of the first um, episodes that I did, I interviewed Trey Combs. And, you know, we were talking about just his life, and he was there – I guess this is, well, he's a little bit older than you or maybe a lot older than you, but, um, yeah, a lot. Yeah. A lot. So a lot, but you know, he's talking about, you know, he's talking about the, some of the blue water stuff and he, he had done and how he was out there. One of the first people or whatever, but you are also one of the first people that have been out around the world doing this stuff. I mean, how many, how many, I mean, obviously it's a more yellow dog came in and that's kind of opened things up, but when did all this change? When did it become this big, like, people start doing what you're doing. What you, I mean, you've been doing it for 30 or 40 years, right? Yeah, I was going to say, I actually was doing it long before, you know, Yellow Dog ever approached me. Probably the reason they came to me is like, because they, number one, I'm really good friends with Jim Klug. Oh, yeah. Long before he had his business, we we had been friends. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I know I know how to travel. And I know a lot of the places around the world, and that's how I teamed up with those guys, and it's been awesome. I actually don't do a lot of hosting like some of the other ambassadors do. You know, hosting for me was something I did, but it was before Yellow Dog. I was doing right through the, the fly shop, and then I did quite a few on my own because that was my only means to see the world. But um, after I'd seen the world a bunch, then it's actually kind of interesting because, you know, companies or, or lodges will have me come to them, so I write a blog for them. And uh, I don't know if you've seen my blog, yeah. but yeah. I have a really extensive blog, yeah. and, uh, you know, it's kind of nice. So, like... Uh, for instance, I'm going to go to Cameroon, and realistically, it's probably going to be hard for my boys at Tourette to get Americans to come to Cameroon because it's so off the radar, it's unbelievable. Hmm. But then if they stumble into my blog, I wonder what's going on fly fishing in Africa. Maybe we should go. They're going to see Cameroon because I'm going to write day-by-day accounts, and hopefully it's mind-boggling. Hmm. So a lot of my travel now is doing things like that. Just It's almost like people have a, a brochure on the Internet based on an American's travel and experiences and that uh, really helps them sell their trips. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And I, we talk, 
very briefly about the conservation stuff. Obviously, it's important and all that, you know, um, for you <laughs> to do what we do. But, um, you know, I mean, have you seen over the years, you fish for all these species, have you seen a, a lot of the, the changes and some things that you hit, you know, back in the day and now maybe you don't fish for them as much? And is that the same when you look worldwide, say Africa or any other country? Uh, absolutely. You know, I'd say the changes I see are more closer to home. And I don't want to make it sound like I don't like any places. I won't even name a place, but, uh, you know, traveling in Central America back in the, in the late eighties and early nineties, when I was just starting my travel, I mentioned that that's where I started traveling first. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the flats, some of the, the tarpon fisheries, you know, a little further south in the flats were, they were abandoned of other anglers. I mean, I have them all to myself. I was, I'll be honest with you. That was kind of a, a spoiled brat in, <laughs> in Belize in the late eighties. I, I mean, I've Hank, the, the, the people at Turner Flats um, were so nice to me in Belize River Lodge. And, uh, you know, I'm out there fishing the waters. And we never saw another boat. It's pretty busy now. And, you know, yes. fishing is still great. And actually, to tell you the truth, it's probably better now um, because, you know, people are aware that you don't eat bonefish, you don't eat permit, you don't eat tarpon. And fishing is incredible. But, you know, for me, the experience is different. And uh, although I love the great fishing, I also miss a little bit of the remoteness that I used to feel. Yeah, you know, when I was younger. So I see changes like that, but most of the changes are, I'd have to say are good because, you know, when we discover a fisher and we love it, we start to protect it. Yep. And, um, you know, That's certainly true. a great thing. That's true. Yeah. And you mentioned Jim, <coughs> Jim, uh, Clug, and I was talking to, um, all right. Is it, it's, is it Clug or Klug? Klug. Yeah. Klug. I was talking to, uh, I guess, um, I think it was the Drake episode, um, and I think Elliot was mentioning that, you know, he mentioned that he thought that back, you know, on that day, and I guess you were a part of that group, he mentioned Jim Klug and, you know, Tom Bai and some of the other people that were out of that Jackson area, and it sounds like you were one of those guys that kind of were part of the uh, the start of this whole thing, and do you, do you see it that way, or were there people before you that paved the way? I mean, obviously there are people before you, but what do you see about that transition? What was so special about what you guys had going there? Well, because there were so many um, destinations that really hadn't been tapped at all. Um, there were definitely, and by the way, yeah, there were people that were ahead of me, but um, it was easier for them because there were more places and they were closer to home. I mean, think about it go back to the 1920s and 30s, the Keys were like mm -hmm. off the map. Wow, how mm -hmm. cool is that? Yeah. Oh my God, we're going to the Marquesas. Imagine that. Right. And then uh, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now we're going to the Bahamas. Now we're, what about Belize? And, uh, you know, Africa was off the radar for those guys. But uh, they definitely got it going because I remember I just idolized those guys. And I loved looking at those old pictures. I My favorite book as a kid was McLean's Encyclopedia. I don't know. Yeah even know what that is, yeah, I do. but yep. there's, if you read, um, oh, right in the beginning of the book, you know, the introduction, it, it was written by somebody since AJ had died. And I just remember it said, you know, AJ McLean has caught more than 300 different species of fish in four or five countries. And I remember when I was like 22 reading that, it was like, Oh my <laughs> God, mm -hmm. 45 countries, you know, 300 yeah. fish. And we're talking spin rod too. That's cool. And uh, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm 35 years old, and I'm like, man, I've been to 30 countries. What's going on here? <laughs> and then you just, and then all of a sudden the ball was rolling. It's like, okay, I'm going to take three months, and I'm going to travel Asia and knock off, you know, another eight countries and 10 different species of fish, and it just never stopped. Yeah. Just unbelievable. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, um, you know, some, as with, you've done all the traveling, a little bit of the, maybe a, a travel tip, or it sounds like you've traveled a lot with your wife. Um, are there any tips you can provide that might help somebody that wants to, maybe they're going to Patagonia or whatever to, to make their experience a little better? Yeah, I would say, um, the ultimate travel tip is be smart. Never let your guard down. So if you're, uh, winging it, winging it, you are, you're a little bit vulnerable. And I'm not saying that the world is full of bad people because it's not, but when you're traveling, you, you, you are going to run into people that will take advantage of you if you, if you let them. And I, I always call it like, um, you know, not really petty crime, but a good person, a pretty good person can be a bad person if you make it so easy for them. So the first thing I learned traveling in Central America is how quickly you can get pickpocketed and, uh, and you don't even know it, oh, wow. you know, when I was in my 20s. 
And then, you know, and this is back in the late 80s, early 90s. Maybe it's not so bad anymore, but it sharpened me up right away. You know, it's like, wait a minute. I got to start paying a little better attention to this stuff. Maybe I'm going to, you know, carry my money in a fanny pack under my shirt like those nerds that I've seen, you know, from other parts of the world. Yep. And, uh, and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, wait a minute. That actually works. I didn't get pickpocketed this trip. I got all my money. My buddy got pickpocketed because he didn't listen to me. Oh, God. So that's the first thing is just having your head screwed on tight. And um, there's, a, there's an old saying, too. Anybody that's too nice to you, don't trust them. Oh, Anybody yeah? that's kind of firm and a little bit mean, but if they tell you something, it's probably true. Hmm. So that was another ultimate travel tip. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm going deeper than beyond the fishing, but, you know, it all adds up to you. the end. You want to have a good fishing experience, but you got to get there. Yep. And getting there's not easy. Yeah, yeah. No, those are great tips. I mean, the that is a good one about the uh, being uh, being too nice. Definitely keeping and Roy. Really, yeah, just anybody you run into out there, you got to be a little bit wary of of uh, running into the the wrong person. Um, those are cool. So, what do you think? You know, with your travels again, you know, this fit fishing or not? But is there a? I mean, you must have some some stories over the years that are a little crazy. Did anything come to mind that sticks out as one of the crazier stories you, you've had over the years? Yeah. Well, the, 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 my best travel story of all time is running into a Bengal tiger and it's too long a story to tell what people can read about it on my, on my website. Or if you just Google up Jeff Courier tiger, it'll come up, but I came real close to getting waxed by a tiger <laughs> in 2008 when I was fishing with my good friend, Misty Dillon. Unfortunately, I'd got a little bit away from the boys that day and doing my own thing. It was a close call, hmm. but, um, one that comes to mind, it's always a great one was, uh, my wife and I, that trip to Africa, that three month trip, it basically mm-hmm. turned into a hitchhiking trip because the bus systems were so awful. You know, I remember we waited two days for a bus and ended up never coming. So luckily we had three months, so it wasn't like time was of the essence, but it was pretty miserable hanging out in a, you know, hundred degree, hot sunny place and then at night when it got dark and the critters come out and the sketchy people at the bus stations and right. i just remember the local scene guys we hitchhike it just felt so wrong as an american to hitchhike in africa i mean you don't even fathom that hmm. well we started and everything went everything was great um people were so nice and uh you know we ended up hitchhiking across africa we went from zambia to botswana to namibia and then back to zambia and then over to uh malawi and um we got denied coming and going into Mozambique because our, we couldn't get our visas organized properly. They wouldn't let us do them at the border. So anyway, when it was time to go home, we decided we were going to take a bus um, just because we had tons of gear. We had bought a bunch of stuff and uh, we ended up getting on a small, bad bus. And when I say bad, it was like a minivan with 27 people, oh, God. which we had done. A, we had done a few of those and we knew how to handle it. Basically, that bus would be parked and wouldn't leave for like, you know, hours. You just have to swelter in the sun at the bus station. Well, my wife and I would grab the front seat next to the bus driver. And my wife, she's such a good sport. She would literally just sit there those four or five hours and just make sure that we got those seats. I go, you know, maybe go down to the pool hall or something, Mm -hmm. something stupid, but Mm -hmm. just having a good time with the locals. Anyway, that bus left the capital, Lawangwe of Lawangwe is the capital of Malawi, and we headed for the Zambia border. And we came into this small town, and I was sitting in the front seat, had the window down. I was the most comfortable guy in the bus other than the bus driver. And uh, there was a lady on the side of the road with a basket on her head and a big lady, and we slowed down to pick her up. And I just remember saying to my wife, I'm like, where in the heck is this lady going to go? There's no no way. (laughs) Well, when the bus slowed down within two seconds, I had somebody trying to rip me out the window. And on the other side, the bus driver was getting ripped out the window. And uh, uh, luckily, the, you know, the guys sitting behind me, you know, that were crunched in with the 20-something people in the back, they started fighting the guy and trying to, you know, keep me from getting yanked out the window. Oh. The door was locked, but they couldn't, it was like way down inside the door, thank God. But they were trying to reach in and open the door from the inside. So I'm fighting. The two guys behind me were fighting. The two guys behind me were like, holy oh, windows, just start putting up the window. So I started putting up the window the best I could. I, I was lucky I wasn't ripped out in the street. The bus driver, he was just about ripped out his, but he kind of got, the guys behind were fighting for him too. He plopped back in his seat and he ripped out about a, Oh, probably a 14-inch bladed Bowie knife. Mm. 
and he just started swinging and he was hitting people and people, the guys that were trying to take over the bus, he hit like three of them, a couple of them hung out of the door. He was flooring it. And, uh, we just watched this bloody mess drop off the back of the bus. And I remember the bus driver, bus driver takes his knife, wipes it off on his pants and stuffs it back under the seat and looks over at me and smiles. And I'm like, you've got to be shitting me. This guy, this guy is used to this, (laughs) you know? And, uh, I was, my wife and I were just like shaking and, you know, I looked back at the bus, you know, everybody else was a little shook up, but they were really just going back to their business. Yep. So that's it. It can happen. We were very lucky in three months. We had nothing but great rides other than some uncomfortable ones, but that was the only time we ran into danger. And it turns out it was a personal dispute between the bus driver and somebody in that town. So oh, it was, we just got caught in it. Oh, no kidding. So, and that was your, your first trip to Africa. Yeah. Yeah, but that was towards the end. You remember, I said something there a little while about never let your guard down. Always stay strong. That was because it was the end of our trip. We were getting too comfortable. Uh, you know, I'm hanging out the window. Probably, you know, I probably looked like an easy target. You know, right. here comes some some white guy from probably America. He's probably got money. Let's uh, let's sting this whole thing. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that's uh, God. I know. I'm sure we could probably sit here and. And talk about some of these stories all day. We kind of, you know, it's easy to get, to get off track. I mean, obviously I think, you know, thinking about the, the tiger fishing is, you know, is kind of what I wanted to dig into here. I, you know, before we get along too far, I I guess we are pretty long here, but, um, any other, anything else you want to talk about with, with tigers as far as, you know, again, if somebody wants to learn more about it, I mean, is there a good resource? Obviously your, your website, it sounds like a good one. What would you recommend if somebody wanted to learn more about how to get started other than maybe your website and and the yellow dog stuff? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, uh, unfortunately because it's a, a, an exotic fish, I don't know of a lot of books about it, but, um, a lot of the African, uh, fly fishing magazines, um, there's one really good one called the mission and, uh, they often have tiger fish uh, articles in there. So I think really, you know, you Google tiger fish articles, you're going to get some of these articles and, and just read the more current ones because it's a fishing that has evolved a lot in the last 10 years. You know, like I said, now we're using straight 40 pound tests because we want to land the fish. There's no one out there to mess around and, and just hook them and lose them. We're there to catch them. So make sure the, the stories are current, but mm-hmm. there is a lot of stuff. And South Africans are really very avid fly fishers. I spent a lot of time in South Africa. I was over there in November, and I'll be back over there again in February. So I have a lot of, of friends, and I can honestly say they are some of the best fly anglers that I've ever fished with, which is why I enjoy going over there and fishing with them. I learn stuff every time. But they are very familiar with tigers. They don't have a lot of tiger fish in South Africa. They do up in the north part near Kruger National Park, but those guys travel. You know, they can drive. It's, you know, a two-day drive to get into Tanzania or up into Zambia and fish on the Zambezi. So they do it. They're very knowledgeable. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, and I'll leave a, a link to the mission and some of the other resources you've mentioned here at uh, wetflyswing.com slash Jeff. I'll have uh, all the show notes and links to this stuff. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to jump in, in in a little bit here to a little bit of a uh, rapid fire round. But, you know, you mentioned your wife a couple times and, you know, I know uh, I was doing a little bit of research and I'm not exactly sure. I'm kind of a, a not too smart in some of the stuff, but as far as, you know, the the background and stuff, it, your your wife is not Caucasian. Is she? What is her background or her ethnicity? She, uh yeah, well, her her dad is uh, was a German bike racer, white as can be, and her mom was from Jacksonville, Florida, as African as you can be, and uh, yeah. just a great story how they met, and very cool. So my wife is uh, mulatto, and she's it's funny because we go different places in the world. We could be in Egypt, and they'll look at me, and then they'll look at her, and they'll start talking away in Arabic to her, and she's like, "No, I'm not Egyptian." <laughs> and they're like, "You're not really." We'll be somewhere in South America and they'll start, you know, they look at her and just start firing away in Spanish. She's like, I'm not local. <laughs> I just look a little bit like everywhere we go. So that's cool. It's kind of cute, kind of fun, but she loves to travel, loves to fish. She's not crazy like I am, but, sure. uh, yeah, she's, she's been down the road. She's done it. That's cool. No, I, and I, I bring that up because, you know, I think, um, you know, there's probably some people, maybe not in the audience here, but obviously there's parts of the world where you, you know, you kind of have some of this kind of the negative end of it, you know, and obviously, you know, whether the stuff we've gone through in this country with racism, things like that is, is obviously some dark days, but you know, when you look at your, you know, your relationship, uh, have you, has that been something that uh, you've probably had to deal with that a little bit over the years and and how have you, 
you know, how have you got past that stuff or is it something you don't even think about anymore? No, we never even thought about it in the beginning. We were That's too cool. young and dumb to think <laughs> about it. Luckily, luckily it wasn't a big deal. That's cool. And, uh, yeah, it's been to our advantage. If anything, anywhere we go, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. All right, well, let's uh, let's let's stay on the um, you know the tips and stuff a little bit here with the the you know the tigers, or I guess we can talk a little bit generally. But if you had to say your top two, you know, top two tips for you know fishing for, I guess we could talk about predatory fish, maybe to keep it general. Um, do you do you have a couple of tips? And you mentioned two flies as well. Do you do you have a couple of flies that you you said the purple and black is one good one you use? Yeah, that's definitely a go-to fly for me. You know, I think they call it the peanut butter, but whatever. Black and purple um, bait fish pattern is is always something that's going to be in my box. Like if I was trout fishing, I'm always going to have a parachute Adams and a Royal Wolf in there. So black is good. And, you know, I, I'm not much of a fly tire and I'm not much of a, of a tying or fly pattern nerd. So for me, I'm like, make sure you have some black flies and make sure you have some tan flies. Hmm. Anything in between there. Now you'd be trying to be a specialist and, you know, there probably is a couple special flies in there, but when you do it something fast and dirty on an exploratory trip, you've got to make sure you just have some light flies and dark flies because between those two flies, they are going to get it done for you. One or the other, if not both anyway. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and then as far as a, a tip or two, do you have something, you know, uh, if you're going for some of you know, maybe the tigers over there or just, uh, just kind of predatory fish in general? I would say everywhere you go in the world, if you're making a huge effort to get there and you're going to be there a while, you need to have three different lines. You need to have a floating line. You need to have a kind of an intermediate sinking line and a fast sinking line. So those three lines, you know, some dark bait fish patterns, some light bait fish patterns, um, a good selection of tippet, you know, you know, have that 40 pound test. I probably use that as my tippet, as my leader, my whole leader more times than any other place on the planet and some wire and you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. We could drop you off in Africa. We could drop you off in the Amazon. We could drop you off on a Messier river in Bhutan and you are, yep. you've got everything you need to catch a few fish. Right on, right on. Okay. And, and about, a nine weight. And a nine weight. That's right. So nine weight and not a, not a 10 weight, not 11 weight. Uh, but the nine weight is kind of the all around. It is a good all rounder. It really is. Yeah. It's a little bit heavier. The eight weight is, I guess, you could use it, but you'd be some of those bigger fish. Is this for, for tigers, you'd get worked a little bit on those? You know, I, I think you and I would handle the eight just fine because we're experienced. But, you know, some people don't have the experience with big, harding, jumping fishes, you know, and, and yeah, nine's a little better. And also, I mean, I just was very vague there. You know, I mentioned four continents, what I'd use that <laughs> rod for. But, you know, an eight weight and a big peacock bass, you're in trouble. And an eight weight with a big golden moss there and, Asia, you're in trouble because those fish pull pretty damn hard. Yeah. So yeah. a nine's a little better. Yeah. And I don't like it 11 or 12 no. because it's just starts being too heavy yeah. for most fish. Exactly. Okay. And, and how about, uh, you know, when you hook one of those fish, so maybe you can talk about what that's like when you hook into them and then maybe a, a tip as far as playing big fish or just big fish in general, how, how you can, you know, I guess you lose some of them, but how, how do you land those big guys? Well, the tigers, uh, that, that is what, why they are the, probably the best game fish of Africa. Their fight is incredible. I, I would compare it to um, like an Atlantic salmon or a steelhead because they hook and they run, and they, they hit you hard, and they run like you can't believe, and they jump a lot. So they're very difficult to keep buttoned on. I mentioned a little bit about hooking a tiger fish, but it's all very hard bone and teeth. So when they hit you, you've got a strip set as hard as you ever did in your life, and not all of my African buddies, they like to hit him four or five times. I, I'm not sure that that helps so much. I think that one initial, you know, strip set and the fish grab at the same time, you're either going to get them or you're not. But um, mm-hmm. it's hard to get a, a hook in there. So good, you know, we talk about fly patterns, but make sure you're using good quality hooks. Mm-hmm. And I say that because, you know, back in my hosting days, you know, I got a guy that's spending $6,000 on a trip and he shows up with a flyzy tide and I look at the flyzy tide and they're on the worst hooks he could have ever bought in his mm-hmm. life. I'm like, dude. You're here to hook and drop fish instead of hook and catch fish. So, oh, yeah, make yep. sure you use good hooks. And, and good hooks you, are essential. Do you have a, a a company that you would recommend as far as a good hook for those? Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a few. The Gamagachus, the owners. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of the ones in Africa that I just love. Actually, you got to oh grips. They're grips. they're an incredible hook. 
and uh, they were designed for fishing tournaments and also for hooking a tiger fish or a Nile perch and a lot of your saltwater fish with hard mouths. But, cool. you know, you Google up good hooks, you're going to, they're going to be listed there right there in front of you. Yep. Yep. Okay. I will say I like, I do like, uh, there's a hook called the octopus hook, which yep. is a very strange gap, a little turn. I do love those for tigers. Mm-hmm. I really do. Yep. Yeah. That is a good hook for sure. What, um, <clears throat> so, you know, you got the 400 club, the 500 club, um, you know, is there anybody else doing it? I mean, you're kind of the guy that comes up always out there, but are there other people that are kind of right behind you kind of nipping at your toes, trying to do the same thing? I don't think so. Yeah. I just, I think there's people that are definitely have caught. I mean, I get notes all the time. Like, thanks for making me wake up to all the different species that live every year at, at home, you know, but I don't think that, uh, there's anybody out there chasing species. And I don't know, you know, I've been fortunate because I was started a long time where there are fish that, you know, it's pretty hard to find them anymore. So it's kind of a bummer. I mean, yep. I was lucky I got started when I did. Right. It's not getting easier. No, no, it's not. Yeah, d- definitely. Well, you mentioned steelhead. There's definitely some struggles with the steelhead and some of the salmon runs and stuff. <clears throat> um, yeah, that is that is pretty, you know, it's pretty amazing that you're, you know, you're kind of out there on this doing your own thing because it seems like you know as we're talking here it seems like a pretty amazing pretty amazing life i mean what you've done you've traveled the world you've if you love fishing you're you're fishing you're doing all this stuff so i guess it just surprises me there aren't more people but i I, maybe that just shows you how difficult the thing is that you've done all these years it is it is no doubt difficult and i actually don't know how the hell it happened for (laughs) me because i did it with without money you know there are people out there that and there's a lot of young people out there that have a pretty good pocketbook and they're out there hitting all the hot spots, you know, boom, lodge here, lodge there, right. lodge there. But yeah. that's, it's different. It you know, is. you don't get the, the three months living on the, the local buses in India and Nepal or hitchhiking across Africa. It's a whole different thing. Yeah. Yeah, that is cool. And it's, I think it's better, even though I probably couldn't do it like I used to. Yep. Because it's hard. I agree. I think you're getting into the, that. That's the cool thing about the traveling thing. And I was trying to remember the name of a guy who's got a travel blog. I mean, there's hundreds and whatever, thousands of travel blogs. But yeah, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about it is that you're in these communities and um, there's probably a lot of lodges and things you go to where maybe you don't even connect with the local community. And that, that seems to be the the amazing thing about w- traveling is that you're meeting the, these people who you'd never meet if you just sat in the U.S. and never left home. So I, I think it's cool you're able to do it. Um, so, yeah, just getting back, I mean, we got about, uh, oh, I guess, if you do you have a little time for a little rapid fire round here? Sure. Okay, yeah, I got a few questions I like to always run by. And um, the first one, just thinking about, you know, a, a gear, you've done a lot of traveling, um, you know, Yeti and all, all these companies come up a lot when we're talking here, but do you have like a go-to piece of gear? It doesn't necessarily have to be fly fishing, but something that, that you don't leave home without? Uh, yeah, chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> I can't leave home without chocolate, and it's actually very difficult because most of the places I love to fish are hot climate type places. Oh, yeah. So I was good deal with the melt factor. But uh, right yeah. here in Victor, Idaho, is a company called Kate's Real Food, and they they make uh, energy bars. And uh, some of hers are very very chocolatey, and they don't melt. So oh, cool. Yeah. Have a little protein and uh, yeah. something that tastes like chocolate for me is critical. Even though it's not gear, it helps me catch fish and helps me be happy. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, Kate's, I'll have to look into that. I love, I'm a big uh, trail bar sort of person. I, and I uh, haven't found one that's good, that tastes good. You know, I remember the power bars were just so terrible tasting. But uh, so that's good. So these these actually, it's not just chocolate. You get a little something else on top of it with these ones. Yeah, they're actually, she's, uh, I don't know if she's a professional skier, but darn close to it and that's how she got involved making them she was making them for herself there you go and uh yeah they're pretty darn good the other thing i would you know as a more gear thing i would say is um when it comes to luggage i like to have a waterproof 100 percent waterproof bag even for my checked luggage because you know you end up uh you know you fly to africa and then you gotta jump on a smaller plane i guarantee at some point in your trip your bag is going to be sitting out you know, it's not like the U.S. where they're in a nice hooded little things waiting for the next plane. Yep. Might be just sitting on the tarmac, and if you're in a tropical place, you could get a five-minute rain <laughs> that is so frigging soaking wet that your stuff is just trashed. And the problem with the tropics, once it's wet, you can't get it dry unless you have a dryer, and I don't usually have a dryer handy when I'm on a trip. Yep. 
So I love the the, the waterproof Sims, big orange oh, zipper yeah. bag, and, and the new Yetis. They're just yep. they're incredible. I don't go anywhere without those. Yep, ever. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that's a good tip for sure. Yeah, that's something I'm sure people that have never traveled out there ever think about. So that's a good one. Um, what about we had a question from uh, Roy Morris in the Facebook group. He asked. Um, I mentioned you were coming on. He wanted to know about uh, if you had a go-to fly for trout. Go-to fly for trout for me, parachute Adams. Yeah. Yep. All right. Perfect. Yeah, that's a... I can make that work yep. for anything. Exactly. Cool. What about, you know, I'm sure you I'm sure you get this one all the time, um, you know, but uh, favorite, uh, maybe your, well, maybe we won't say favorite species, but we'll say... Um, your your most and, and your least memorable fish oh well i would say the least memorable i i guess i'm thinking that he's talking about one that really just you know you lost and and upset you the most and that yeah and let's just say that's what i'm going to assume it is and sure. for me is a fish called the Af- africanus which is um he's like a permit in fact, he looks very much like a perm. He's got a little weird purplish color to him, but he feeds on on oysters. He rips them out of the rocks, and he lives he lives in the most unforbidable place you could be. I mean, huge waves splashing up on the on the reef, and you're trying. And literally, the reef comes up, and it's ten feet deep, and it sweeps out, and there's no water. And there will be six of these things sticking in you know, with their faces down the reef, ripping out oysters, <laughs> and their tails sticking up. And you make your cast, you can't tell where your fly went, and then you get hit by the wave. If you Google up Jeff Kerr, Africanus, you will see a story that's unbelievable. But I hooked one, fought him for 35, 40 minutes, and went through every hoop you could possibly have gone through. It was an absolute miracle. And I lost the fish right as I was five feet from bringing the leader in the rod. It oh, just man. came unbuttoned. Huh. Pulled out of his mouth. That's yep. by far the most horrible losing of a fish in my life. Mm-hmm. And then most memorable catch, hmm, there's quite a few I'd have to say. Probably catching my first big golden moss here because my wife and I, when we spent three months in India and Nepal, just kind of riding buses and trains, we never got one on the fly completely. Three months, didn't get one. And uh, you know what India stands for? No. I never do it again. <laughs> and uh, that's how hard that trip was and that we didn't catch the fish. But then along yeah. came my good friend, Misty Dillon, who owns Himalayan Outback. And uh, he contacted me and said, you know, you need to come back and get this done. I'll help you do it. I promise you'll do it. And uh, I wasn't going back for nothing because I, that was a tough trip. But finally, I, I decided I'll go back and fish with Misty. And I got my big bus here with him on oh, the cool. second day. Cool. Fishing with him. And uh, yeah, so that fish for sure nice. would be number one. Nice. All right. And what about, um, this is back to the tips. Um, uh, as far as length, I guess you're, if you're casting out a boat there for, you know, for tigers or something, is there any tips that, you know, you have for controlling your line? I'm not sure how far you're casting, or maybe you just take it more generally. I, you know, does anything come to mind when you have that question? Um, I would say nothing that I don't do every single time in a boat. And um, for tigers, you know, it's just an average cast. You know, you're probably casting 40, 50 feet on average, maybe once in a while longer, once in a while shorter. But anytime I get in a boat, Especially when it's not mine, I look around for all the problems that I'm going to run into when I'm fishing out of this boat. Oh, yeah. um, you, know, you know, where's the rope tied on to, you know, oh my God, there's this guy's got, you know, four spin rods under the bow, <laughs> even though I told him we're not spin fishing at all for nothing. So I always look into that stuff. And I, before I even start fishing, I clean it. I yeah. clean the area. And if you're with a guide and he's never seen you before and he sees you do that, he knows you mean business. Yeah. So there's no, there's no sense in waiting till you have the first screw up where your line gets hung up on something, fix it before it happens. And, uh, then you should be set. Nice. And I do carry a stripping basket. A lot of places I go, I don't use them in the boats very often, but almost every trip I go on, I have a stripping basket just in case I need it. Okay. Okay. And, and on, on the boats thing, you, you probably, I'm not sure if, if you used any, like the, um, the, like the paddle board out there, have you seen many guys using that? Um, those types of boards out there. I've heard people are traveling a lot with them now. Yeah, no, I have a, uh, my wife, I should say has a travel blow up, mm-hmm. um, paddle board. And, but I, I haven't done it enough to be comfortable on it. I yeah. feel like I'm going to flip over yeah. and drop my Winston. That's right. But, uh, they do make sense. I think for 
you know, somebody that's younger and has a little better body core than this guy in their mid fifties. Yeah. Um, I think it could be a great tool, you know, fly down to Mexico or fly anywhere. And especially for ocean destinations where you can just get off the beach a little bit, fish from would be great. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. So, okay. And then, um, so smallmouth bass, I think I heard somewhere along the, the way or read that, um, that's kind of your, your fate. Well, if you had to pick one species, uh, I'm not sure. Is that kind of one of the ones you still love to fish for? Yeah, I love it. I, I dedicate at least, you know, 15 days a year to go smallie fishing. Mm-hmm. Still do. And uh, I guess it's just kind of, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I told you back in the beginning, all the different fish I caught, I always would probably the ones that made me the most satisfied is when I got a big smallmouth bass. And that was always my dad's favorite too. And he boy, he got a big one when I was a kid, which made an impact on me. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so I love fishing smallies and I especially love doing it, going right back and visiting my mom every summer and fishing smallmouth bass right in the same spot I did when I was a kid with my dad. Yeah. And that's great. Um, probably probably hit those spots right up till the day i die yeah that's good stuff so i i've got a couple of random questions for you here um uh, music i'm not sure if you're a big uh, music fan but do you have anything you you listen to that you know you enjoy whether on the river just hanging out on the well you said sitting on the car you listen to the ball game you, you more sports or music i would say that uh during fishing season and here in the summer you know summer is baseball season so i i time almost all my fishing my trout fishing around cubs games Maybe it's, uh, you know, if I'm going to be heading to the Henry's Fork for the evening hatch, I'll leave first pitch yep. so I can listen to the game while I'm driving and kill the time. But when I'm doing like overnight float trips, you know, I bring my XM radio portable and uh, as soon as that game starts, set it up in the back seat of my boat and just tell everybody to shut up and fish. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that's important. But I do listen, I listen to a lot of different kinds of music. I mean, I work out to heavy metal, old stuff, ACDC, Van Halen. Mm-hmm. Um, right now I'm in the stick figure because when we were down in French Polynesia at Anatole a couple weeks ago, some of the younger guys that, um, that I was hanging out with, that's what they were listening to. And they got me hooked on it. Stick so, figure. Stick figure. Yeah. It's pretty good. If you okay. haven't heard it, no. so go on Pandora and listen to it. They're, okay. they're pretty damn good. That's what I was doing just before you called cool. to them. Cool. And that's a, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes, but is that kind of a, is that heavy metal or what, what type of music? No, they're more like uh, a reggae type. Oh, cool. But it's yeah. a little different. I mean, I really dug it. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. Yeah, I love reggae. For sure. I listen to a lot of Neil Young, lots of Neil Young. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Definitely. I, uh, can't remember who I was talking to. Uh, another one we were, we were chatting about. Uh, I haven't asked this music question. I, I just kind of started doing it because it's really interesting, you know, to hear the background. I love throwing in a little uh, little music into the show notes, so I'll, I'll do that. But, um, yeah, we we're talking about, um, I think he, uh, gosh, who was it? Um, I can't even remember now, but one of my guests in the past went to Woodstock. We, we somehow, he, he oh, was wow. there at Woodstock. Yeah, and he talked about how he, he saw Neil, uh, well, see, I guess it was Neil Young in the, uh, I think it was Neil. Anyways, I'm drawing a blank now on the but I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to that episode as well so um so cool now what about um as far as a uh, something that nobody knows about you do you want to share anything that's something that you know you've done all these interviews and i think you've been on some of these shows multiple times but is there anything that you haven't you you want to share yeah i mean i i think god what is it there that people do ask that and i think it kind of reverts back to if you ever want to get to know me bring a piece of chocolate yeah um but we kind of already covered yeah. that but that would be one. i guess what a lot of people don't know is that um that i really like to be home you know everybody sees my travel schedule and like god that guy's always doing this and that and that and this yeah. but um because home is you know last year i was gone nine months i think i was gone 290 wow. days or this year, the year that we're in right now. Huh. So when I'm home, it's it's almost like a, va- a special vacation. It is. Like I'm enjoying right now looking at it. This, even though it's cold out there, I'm going to go do my hike here in a little bit. Usually I go up and hike that. There's a mountain that I go to the top of every other day. <laughs> and I didn't make it up yesterday because I had my Christmas hangover. So I'll mm-hmm. do it today. And uh, yeah, people don't realize that I ride my bike and I hike and I do a lot of things that aren't fishing related. And I like to be home. That's cool. No, it makes total sense. That That's your... I mean that is your vacation. You 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 travel nine months and and your your home is your break. So how many how many countries has has it been? Do you do you have a tally on that? Yep, I've fished in sixty two, and uh, you know I passed through a few others that I wasn't able to wet a line on because you know, maybe a long layover or traveling through that country to get to another. But sixty two fished countries now. Gotcha, gotcha, cool. Next one, 
next different one will be Cameroon in March. That's it, Cameroon in March. All right, well, uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that. So, um, yeah, that's uh, Jeff, that's about all I have for you. You know, obviously, there's uh, I've got a ton of questions that came up as you were talking today, but we won't, we won't get to those now. Um, I did want to just, uh, before we let you go in the next six to 12 months, maybe talk about, you know, you got the Cameroon trip coming up. Anything else we can expect from you to keep an eye out for? Um, well, I'll be fishing the, uh, the world championships in February. So there's a world championships of fly fishing and they have three divisions. When I was young, I used to fish in the men's and, uh, it was great. I got to fish a lot of a lot of places in Europe that are very expensive to normally get to fish. I was very blessed to be on that team, and oh, yeah. I did well. So this I retired the, when I was probably thirty eight. Yeah, yeah, the this, World Championships. This is the team Team USA, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, totally. few years ago they started a Masters division, and uh, so I'm going to go fish in the Masters in South Africa. In uh, I think we leave February second, and uh, I think we're going to do pretty good. Like I say, yeah. I was over there just in november so i saw some of the waters which is nice we usually don't get the opportunity to see the water till we get there but i was over there visiting friends anyway and it's a venue that could be good for us mostly lake fishing for trout but uh we should we should be able to do good so i'm excited about that yeah it's gonna be interesting i'm gonna go to africa twice in the month of february no kidding you might as well just stay yeah. you might as well just stay over there <laughs> I should, but I got to come home and do the uh, Pleasanton, California fly fishing show. I was already booked for that. Oh, there you go. That's cool. I like yeah, yeah. I like visiting my friends there too. So. That's right. Yeah, oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're going to be on the show tour. So, what? Um, how, how far do you get around? Do you get all around the country on that tour? Yeah, yeah. This year I'll be doing most of uh, the fly fishing shows. The only one I won't be at is the Atlanta one because that's when the tournament is. But yeah, next weekend in Denver. So it's Denver, Boise, Boston, Jersey. Then do the. Uh, tournament then come back and do california as well as some cities in california then then uh the cameroon trip then the phoenix area and then back to the east coast for a few more yep good stuff all right well well uh yeah i'll I'll provide some leaks out to some of that stuff but um so yeah if if people want to find you they can just head over to uh, jeffcourier.com that's the best way to do it yep there's a contact button if anybody ever has a question and my schedule's on there and uh I'm always, my blog is always active, so yeah. always good stuff going on. Okay, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get a link out to your website, and, uh, but yeah, Jeff, I want to just thank you for coming on here, I appreciate you, you know, this this conversation kind of has gone all over the place, and I think that's what I, I enjoy about it, you know, we talked a little bit about tigers, but um, talked about your life, and it's it, pretty interesting, so I want to thank you for coming on. My pleasure, Dave, <laughs> thanks very much. All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. So, there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Jeff. And shout out to our Patreons, uh, wetflyswing.com slash Patreon uh, to uh, help uh, the show move forward here. Uh, If you get a chance, head over to uh, the blog post for this episode and leave a comment at the uh, bottom and let me know uh, what you enjoyed about the show. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.